of course, in the course of the previous questions, several, um, as I said, discussions, sparking topics have already been raised. But now it's the time to combine all our questions and all our remarks. So the floor is yours. Please remember to say your name and your affiliation and to which speaker you would like to address your question. The gentleman at the back. In the meantime, may I also say that the session is broadcasted and we have been receiving some uh, tweets that uh, if they are not covered by the questions on site and Sylvia and Terry, please feel free to jump in the discussion. Alexander Suvarov, University of Massachusetts Amherst. I would like to draw attention of this auditorium to one uh, kind of risk that uh, we may experience with the uh, new foods. Uh, every time when humankind starts to move species from country to country, continent to continent, we, with those species, we also move different pathogens uh, which live on those species. And although it was mentioned that insects, for example, likely do not have pathogens that may be transmitted to humans, they can have pathogens which may be transmitted to other insects. Uh, and, uh, for example, about insects, there are around 10 million species of insects, insects which comprise 90% of total animal diversity. And there are plenty of uh, other examples when uh, we introduce pathogens with uh, uh, non-intentionally, like uh, chestnut blight uh, introduced to America with uh, uh, Asian species of chestnut, which resulted in uh, entire extinction, almost extinction of ch American chestnut. So uh, I would like to hear comments uh, on this issue uh, from everybody who is an advocate of new species, new, new foods. Thank you. Dr. Roos, would you like to begin and anyone else can? Well, is it on? Yes. Um, well, I can completely agree that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't take risks in the direction of uh, introducing uh, diseases and uh, so so. Uh, well, one way to go is to keep the production where the species are already indigenous, and um, well, for um, for. Some species that is uh, on on the way to be some kind of domestication is the common housefly, which is all over the world uh, already. Um, the black shoulder fly, which is a tropical, uh, or the shoulder flies, which is a tropical species, it seems. Well, I'm not. I'm not an entomologist. I have to say that. So, <laughs> it's. Uh, I cannot. I mean, it's. It's. Uh, it's. It's not completely covering because I. I don't have the. Uh, I don't have the in-depth knowledge about it. But uh, it is in the tropical countries you find the black soldier flies. So that's. So it's the question is where when we transfer it to uh, other regions and. Um, um, well, I think we should take all the precautions um, for for the insects, for that it can be uh, released to the nature and also what it can bring in. Um, but maybe also that we cannot um, predict everything that can happen. So, um, so we did. We need to have an uh, assessment system in place to look after this. But on the other hand, what is the what is the other scenario? This is what uh, uh, Gina is covering. Well, let's stay with our five species of animals and three species of uh, stable foods. Then we uh, take uh, no risk in that in that direction. Or how do we balance this out? So, Do you want all of us to go through, or how would you like to? Well, if you would like to make a comment in relation to this question, please proceed, or else we could continue with other comments or questions. OK. I'll just make the briefest of comments, which is to say that I, I agree with you that one has to proceed with a lot of caution when introducing a new species. I mean, in the case of 
Um, banana, the, the varieties of banana are, are housed in Belgium, actually, in a germplasm center in Leuven. So before it would be released ever, anywhere, it goes through virus screening to make sure that it's virus free. And then it's planted in a very small controlled condition at first to go through an agronomic trial. But so, for example, agronomic trial in, in Uganda to see if it can grow in those conditions, if it's hardy enough for the climate and so. And then, you know, it's, it's really carefully controlled before released to a farmer as a variety that they could possibly use. So we, we try and pay attention, but I think as Nana said, you, you cannot ever avoid all risk, you know, so. I, I personally think that we have rules in the uh, European Union for plant health and so on, and we, we do control it. Uh, and uh, of course, it's not easy stuff, but I really guess that uh, these rules we have uh, still will be valuable. So uh, for the insects, personally, I guess that uh, no insects from the wild will be used in the European Union when they are on the market. So these insects, normally, I guess, they should be really uh, not too problematic because they will be grown up, I guess, in the European Union, mainly in the beginning, maybe. But um, uh, for allergies, your question, uh, so there are cross-reactivities uh, for shellfish uh, and also workers dealing with breeding of insects. Uh, we know that some of workers do have problems because of mite allergy. Or, you know, this, uh, this can be really a problem maybe for cross-reactivity allergens. Yeah. But it's a difficult stuff. Well, it, it is rather interesting how many questions have been caused by the last presentations. So may I also share my concern with you. Years ago, Europeans, particularly Northern Europeans, have realized that they need to increase their fruit and vegetable intake. Yet, as we have seen from this morning's presentation, we're still far away from reaching the target. And during this period, they have visited recipes or products from South Europe and still you can find people from the general public having difficulties in tasting or in including these products into their daily diet. And I'm wondering, after we solve the issue in relation to quality, safety, um, global safety, at the end, we need to educate people on how to use them in their daily cuisine. For example, uh, I'm Greek, and when I travel in the Scandinavia, it's hardly difficult to find a warm vegetable dish. And the variety of vegetables is mostly used in salads, which are rather cold for this climate. So after we solve the technological issues, at the end of the day, we have to think of how people are going to use that in their diet and to educate them. And I very much welcome the um, suggestion by Gina on recipes and educating people and in a way registering traditional recipes that are lost in, in the time. Other questions from the audience? Oh, from the web audience. <laughs> Barbara Manacchini from the University of uh, Palermo. Sometimes, maybe it's a just a general question to who want to answer. I feel that we are in a quite schizophrenic position. On one hand, we want to keep uh, all local biodiversity. I'm from Italy and we are, uh, of course, in this direction. On the other hand, we open from all industrial food. So it seems that uh, the local food will be for a developing country, maybe we want to push them, and for a very rich person or niche of person, and the general masses will have uh, and the industrial food. It's just my idea, or because I really don't find, I, sometimes I found, I'm also collaborating with EFSA, a little bit to a different philosophical approach from HEFSA to FIO. One is more sustainable 
the other one is more sustainable, but is more um, uh, looking for uh, in industrial food. So can we find a compromise on this, or we should keep uh, three different uh, consumers or three different uh, stakeholders? Well, the question about who are consuming the processed food from the in industrialized processed food, that was your question, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I think what we, well, well, what we see is that the consumption of processed foods, the highest increase is in the developing countries, and it's in the urban, in, it's in the rural populations. It's our picture that people in the rural, in rural Africa, rural Asia, that they uh, only eat their homemade food, is uh, it's really shifting very quickly. If you go out in the villages, there are processed foods on the shelves. If you look into dietary assessments on what children are being fed, they are being fed like uh, chips and biscuits. Uh, of poor quality, and that's I think is the problem. I really think we have uh, we have uh, um, a challenge in turning processed food into nutritious foods. It's not a, a law of nature that processed food should be of poor nutritional quality. It can be of uh, it. We can it. We can turn it. Or we can work with the industry to turn it away from being junk food to be nutritious foods because the direction will go in more and more processed foods are going into the diets uh, also in the developing countries. Comment on that. I mean, I think there's a lot of nonsense talked about processed food. Processing of food is essential to feed the urban population. We're no longer in, in contact with producing our own food. Also, people feel time poor about food they want the convenience of actually buying a food in a supermarket, sometimes ready prepared. And it, it's important they have good quality. And we actually have a very good food delivery system. It, it's so good that it's, you can get food 24 hours a day and you can get rather a lot of it and eat it. So I think I don't think it's the nutritional quality is the problem. It's about the choices that people are making because the way food is marketed at them, getting to overconsume foods that are indulgent foods. We all know what they are. They're cakes, they're biscuits, they're ice cream, uh, the things that taste nice, you know. But there's also a, a problem about food processing and the way in which we eat in society. And I think in Italy you have your cultural identity in a Nordic country. They have their own things. And it's very important we retain those. And I, I have a saying saying that families eat together, stay together. And it's actually eating is very important for cohesion. You can talk about processed food. Well, you know, pasta is processed food, and it's uh, Italian food, and it's, well, you might say it's Chinese originally, but it's, it's adopted, you know, throughout, throughout Europe, and it's a very healthy, basic ingredient of meals. So you can, you know, you can attack foods like, let's say, pasta, it's processed food, but, it, you know, to attacking pasta is like attacking Italy, I think, you know. It's like with, you know, British and roast beef. So I, I think we have have this identity we need to retain that identity and we need to look I think there need to be controls on how food is marketed and I think nutritional value is important with with processed food um, and there are some foods coming along you look at it and you say yuck you know and I I, I must say uh, having looked at some of the um, in vitro meat I, I did look at it, and I did think it would look as a tumor burger, you know, so it doesn't really appeal. And I think it's a real problem you're gonna, with novel foods like insects. And insects might be crunchy, like crisps and things, but, I mean, I, it's interesting whether they'd really, really catch on. I mean, I think there's a problem about, you know, growing foods in vitro, and I think we can use real food. I was very interested about your comment on the, the uptake of the Western diet in rural parts of the developing world. 
do you have any idea what's driving that? Is it the same drivers that are driving the lower socioeconomic classes in developed countries to eat the same foods? Price, maybe. Well, I'm not an anthropologist, but that's one of the, I mean, we're, there is an exposure through media and so on. But the other thing is convenient, as uh, just mentioned, that the people are like, just like we are, uh, need convenient food to, uh, because we are busy. It's the same thing, and we see it, we see it very much as a constraint for healthy food for children in rural areas. That's... Well, uh, information about how to prepare your complementary feeds three times a day and uh, with all the ingredients, well, these caretakers just don't have the time. So um, actually providing highly nu nutritious food supplements for, to reach targeted groups of children and women uh, is uh, more and more accepted as one of the interventions that's needed really to break the, the undernutrition curve. We can see improvement, reduction in stunting, but it's going way too slow. We will still have more than 100 million stunted children in 2025, and one of the crucial things is to make this complementary feeding more nutritious, and I don't see any way around that we need to have some highly nutrition processed foods available really to break that curve and not to go beyond instruction and mothers to spend to, to, to do all the cooking themselves. I know there is one question from the audience, but let's give the floor to the web questions. Um, yes, we had a question through the website from uh, someone called Miriam Stones. I'm not sure where she is. She may be in the audience. Um, and she says, I'm confused. Tom Sanders stated emphatically that there is no justification anymore for eating meat protein as we can meet all our protein needs through non-animal sources. But Nana Roos showed a graph which demonstrates the correlation between the lack of animal protein intake and poor nutritional outcomes. So do we need animal-based protein or not? Right, OK. One, one I didn't say we don't need to... Well, vegans who eat no meat actually meet their protein needs OK. If you do it from mixed sources, you have a cereal and a pulse in the diet, you can get adequate protein intake. I, I wasn't advocating not eating any meat, but eating meat less frequently is what I said. You know, so it, it's having more plant food, moving in the direction of vegetarians, but not doing the ism, if you like, the the religious bit of, you know, a pure vegetarian or whatever. But there are things that we can learn from that. You don't have to absorb meat. You don't need the nutrients provided by the meat. They're useful, things like zinc and iron, vitamin B12. You only need to eat a little meat. You don't need to eat large amounts of meat. And in, in Northern Europe, uh, the agriculture is very much based uh, around ruminant agriculture, sheep and cattle. And it is actually quite sustainable in the, the countries that are bordering on the Atlantic have a lot of rain. And you know, so that makes sense to continue having some of that. But I think there is an issue of sustainability, particularly where you're feeding grain to animals. And that goes mainly for poultry and, and pig meat. Now, these are, can be much leaner meats than uh, ruminant meats. But you know, they, you're feeding lots of grain to those animals produce some meat, whereas a cow is just really, and the sheep are just eating grass. Um, so it's quite an efficient production system. So you have to look at the sustainability issue in terms of the production system used in different countries. But the evidence from the health side is that, you know, it's particularly red meat and processed meat have adverse outcomes for cancer, cardiovascular disease, and it looks like, you know, poultry, fish are, are better in terms of health outcomes. The gentleman in the first row.
Thank you very much, Samuel Godefroy from University Laval in Quebec, uh, Canada. I was actually interested by your comment about um, you know, making processed food more nutritious, and I just wanted to hear your comment to this notion about um, are you advocating, uh, for example, that some of the not junk food, I'm going to call it snack food, be, for example, fortified with some you know, vitamins, minerals, or any type of nutrients? Uh, the reason why I'm asking your comment on this is I come from a jurisdiction where this notion was vehemently uh, combated and, and actually um, was really talked against um, in, in Canada specifically uh, simply because the rationale that was used is that doing so would displace uh, in diet the consumption of you know, fruits and vegetables and actually nutrient-rich um, you know, products. There's also another argument that was put, and again, it's, it was from a speculative nature, which is essentially that by fortifying some of these products, uh, you may end up to enhancing the caloric intake uh, of, of, of these products and therefore contributing to uh, the obesity uh, element. And I'm going to add actually an additional question from a methodological standpoint, actually. How do you address these issues from an assessment standpoint? Because as a former regulator, I know that that's something we struggled with. Well, my, my comments were mostly directly for the, directed for the developing countries where and, and for the acceptance that more and more processed foods goes into the diet already. We and to move away from the impression that uh, in rural Africa they don't eat processed foods; they only eat what they get directly from the field and to the into the pot. Um, so, uh, for 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 the fortification of snack foods in in Europe or in Canada. I mean, I come from Denmark and we are probably the, the most resistant uh, European country to fortification of, uh, of different food products. And uh, I don't, uh, and personally, I don't in any way support to fortified uh, unhealthy foods to make them look more healthy, especially not with nutrients that is not deficient in the in the in the, in this population so i mean putting minerals into chocolate bars and to me it doesn't make any sense so um, it's it's really to separate it out between what are the nutritional challenges i comment on this i mean i think you don't turn a good diet into uh, you know, a, a bad, you know, bad diet into a good diet by sprinkling it with some vitamins and minerals is the bottom line. But there is a case for fortification for some foods, and we've done it with folic acid in the USA. And in our, Canada doesn't have legal, le legislation, but does it, and it's reduced neural tube defects very effectively. Uh, so, you know, and the iodine fortification where you've got low... Uh, or low levels of iodine in, in soil is, is a, a good strategy... We, we've fortified bread for, and cereals for years, and if you take things like breakfast cereals, there's quite a, a mixed view inside the European Union about um, additions of vitamins and minerals. In the United Kingdom and in Ireland, where there is fortification of breakfast cereals, it makes a substantial contribution to the intake of micronutrients to, to children. France, on the other hand, allows no, no additions. So, you know, it, it does vary. So they can can be useful, even though some of these breakfast cereals are you know, high, in, high in sugar and salt, they make actually a net contribution. I think there is a view inside the European view that you don't really want additions to foods that are, uh, nutrient addition to foods that are high in saturated fat, salt and sugar. And so that's where we have this idea of nutritional profiling to do it. But I mean, fortification or reduction changing in uh, food composition is, is quite important. So the salt reductions we've achieved in the UK have been, been useful. And I think there are cases where we might look at issues about removing unnecessary sugar or reducing caloric density of food can, can be done to manipulate food. And, and vitamin D is one of the big problems we're grappling with at the moment because the intakes that we want to get people eating are, are difficult to obtain through diet. And so the only way you're going to get the vitamin D up there is tell people to take a supplement, which they probably won't do, or you can 
fortify the food. Um, and then you're at the level you've got to you're fortify at, you don't want to get problems about vitamin D toxicity. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky issue, but it's an effective measure when it works. So uh, just just to add um, on to the discussion and maybe add just, I think, a little bit of precision. So um, Nana's comment, if I understood it correctly, was really in the context of stunting. So children who are not, you know, growing properly. So we have multifactorial causes, including the environment, water, sanitation, but food um, being one of those big issues. I mean, if anybody knows the UNICEF conceptual framework, it's food, health, and care. So this is combining the aspects of food and care Women don't have enough time to, uh, you know, to cook every single meal in the context that's required in order to meet the nutrient requirements for the children because they have many other things that they're doing. So it's trying to see if there's complementary feeding products that could be manufactured that actually provide the needed micronutrients to stimulate better child growth. So it's for a very specific context and very specific age group. And then I think also I would really agree with Nana's point is that what we see even in very rural areas in Cambodia, very rural areas in Vietnam, look at any statistics from Latin America, consumption of things like packaged biscuits, even savory, savory or sweet is hugely exponentially on the rise. And um, like uh, in Asia, it's very common, this instant noodle. So when we did our dietary intake studies in Vietnam, we found that uh, quite a lot of children are getting fed instant noodle, and it really virtually contains nothing except for refined rice noodle that you add on top MSG sodium packet. So I think the point was maybe there's something better that we can feed children than this type of, of food. Yes, please. Uh, Hubert Leiker, EFSA. Um, when uh, our nutritional habits fail and obesity uh, takes hold, uh, we can rely on the pharmaceutical industry to uh, provide us with insulin. And um, I would say we all pay for that through our insurance system. So I was wondering if uh, you have any advice for the food industry on what they can do better to um, avoid having to um, rely on the pharma industry to solve the problem that we didn't solve in the first place. Any suggestions from the speakers for the food industry? <laughs> I think the pharmaceutical industry is also creating a lot of the problems because a lot of the drugs that are being used for treatment of depression, atypical neuroleptics, are actually increasing appetite, causing obesity. A lot of uh, steroid treatment causes obesity. So we actually have medical consequences of pharmacological treatment co contributing to obesity, we tend to forget that. The, the drug industry actually hasn't come up with very effective drugs for the management of obesity either. I mean, the ones that cause sort of anal leakage and you have to wear dark trousers where you uh, inhibit fat absorption, um, not, very, not very effective. I mean, it may well be they will come up with good appetite suppressant. One they did come up with um, was, had to be withdrawn because it made people suicidal. Uh, so there are, there are, there are problems. And I think from the food industry point of view, it is about looking at what the caloric load is from your food. I don't think there's anything specific, particularly really about fat or carbohydrate or sugar. Sugar is no more fattening than starch, but sugary drinks are extra calories outside, like alcoholic drinks are. So I think, I think you know, energy, Density is important. If you can reduce energy density of foods across the board a bit, that should, and people eat the same portion of food, that would help. The other thing I think they could do is we could have smaller plates, please, and smaller cups. If you go to the UK and try and buy cups, you think you're buying them for Shrek the giant. and uh, time flies. So let's start with the lady at the back and we have two more questions. Yes, the thank lady you. at the back. Uh, the question I want to ask the panel and thank them all very much 
uh, for their contributions today. It was great. But time and again, in all of the presentations, nutritious food comes out, the word nutritious food. And we have plates and pyramids and lots of diagrams to show foods divided into groups like cereals, fruits, and vegetables, and dairy foods. And then we have the, but, but the problem, I suppose, is that we eat composite foods, foods that are a mixture. And we have actually great regulations uh, written in the European Union on health claims and on food fortification. But one of the aspects that hasn't been put into uh, place is nutrient profiles. So I would just appeal to the scientists here and the nutritionists to really get working on this. Because EFSA gave us a very good report on how nutrient profiles, which are um, limits on foods that have a high salt or a high saturated fat, and, they, and EFSA said and pointed out how saturated fat can be a surrogate for trans fats, because we really don't have hardly any in the, in the food supply, and for total fat. So you just need sugar, salt, and saturated fat. And you should look at each of the food categories separately. Like obviously for fruit and veg, you wouldn't expect much fat and you would allow more sugar maybe in fruit, for example. But when it comes to dairy, you'd allow a higher amount of saturated fat. So there's an awful lot of work to do in this area. And if we don't move forward on it, at the moment we are allowing health claims on mad foods. Like if, um, for example, as one of the posters that one of my colleagues has presented in, in number 75, if you want to go and look at it, it shows that sherbet sweets at the moment, because of their magnesium content, you could say they're good for children's teeth. Now, people don't look at labels, but they do look at health claims. There's a lot of research on that. So I just would appeal to you as a panel and to everybody here, can you help us out as regulators? Thank you. Well, for the sake of time, we could take your um, intervention as a comment and less of a question than very well taken comment. So the lady at the back with the grey blouse, your question. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is directed to Klaus Riedinger on uh, novel foods. I was wondering if it was really clarified who has to come up with the right standards to test, uh, to come up with a robust testing scheme for the safety aspects of novel food. So who is to do that? And second, uh, is there room then for a subsequent risk benefit analysis? Thank you. Because of the time scale, I, I was not able to talk too much about this issue. But uh, the, now, nowadays there is a recommendation uh, where everything is written down, how to fulfill an application, what, what kind of data is, uh, you need as an, as an applicant. And also the, this recommendation can be used, of course, and is used from uh, all the member states and, of course, EFSA, uh, how to evaluate these applications. That is quite old, so from the year 1997. And I'm really sure that uh, there will be some more aspects uh, where EFSA will, uh, I think, do a uh, presentation or an, uh, a, a document, of course, uh, where, we, where we go deeper uh, for maybe uh, all this kind of uh, nanotechnology stuff or insects, maybe even. Uh, but nowadays we have uh, something and uh, it works, really, I guess. For allergies, it's not easy, that's true. Uh, because uh, for cross-reactivity, you have a lot of uh, issues. Uh, and many foods which are really common in our uh, communities, maybe would be not easy evaluated under Noble Food Umbrella, honestly. Because they have also problems, let's say in case of cross-reactivity, uh, like these reactions. But when people don't know about it, and that is the issue what I wanted to point out with the rapeseed protein, people don't know that they could have a problem with mustard allergy and uh, rapeseed protein because it's new. They don't have any experience about it. And I think this is the issue where we uh, have to point out uh, more and more. And there is also labeling regimes, you know it, I guess. Uh, so many novel foods are labelled in the way that consumers uh, take care on it, uh, on these issues. Yeah. So this is my answer. 
And the very last question from the gentleman. Yeah, Westen of uh, Hamburg again. So, sorry, the, the question is, is a bit complex, <laughs> but uh, um, so our, our taste in evolution, our taste was uh, developed to identify nutritious food. But now if we separate uh, flavor from, from uh, nu uh, nutritious uh, properties. So EFSA gets more and more opinions on, on flavorings to be added to food and feed, and uh, uh, the, the question to you is, uh, uh, could this uh, cause that we lose our sense for identifying nutritious food? Could this go in the wrong direction? So you can mimic, with, with this mix of flavorings, you can mimic every, every kind of taste. You can use uh, just the uh, soy proteins, add uh, flavors, and then it tastes like bratwurst or whatsoever. Yeah. So I just wonder <laughs> what your opinion is whether this could uh, could go in the wrong direction. Well, there, there's a, there's a film called Crocodile of Dundee where he's eating bush tucker, and uh, he's the girl who eats it and she says yuck. He says yes, you can eat it, but it tastes like shit. And I, I think what modern food processing does and what modern cuisines do is actually may have made food taste nice. And I, don't, I think we separated nutrition and palatability, you know, thousands of years ago. And why we add garlic to food when it makes your breath smell is because it gives a, a blend of, of, of tastes and so that we, we, we like. So I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with the hedonic sensations we we get from food uh, at all in terms of the flavors. And it would be pretty horrible to go back to eating British food of the 1950s. That's all I can say. <laughs> English food was feared throughout the world. It was our, it was our uh, weapon. Well, I, I think it's a horrible scenario that we foods is turned into just chemical compositions, and I think we basically eat food and not nutrients. But we, we can see with the we we know quite well, and the future will know more about how small children are actually um, accustoming to different tastes. Like they can get if they are exposed a lot to sugar, they get the sugar craving. That you can. You, you really are programmed early in life for test preferences, and um, I mean, we need to stick to that. We can see when we work with the uh, product development for um, treatment of malnutrition, like when we do it in Southeast Asia, we can add in a lot of fish because there's a great preference for the fish taste, and we can, we can incorporate insects, termites in Africa, crickets and so on, because there is a preference. But it's connected to the food. It's not, it's not detached from the food, even if it's processed. I don't know if, I, if it's cover up on your question. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all predisposed to like sugary, sweet tastes from early on, which in evolutionary terms makes sense. But there is evidence that, you, that infants can be if you like, programmed to like other tastes by what they're exposed to actually in the womb, like what the mother's eating, as well as in the first months of life. Um, so there is an opportunity possibly to get them accustomed to eating other things. The other thing is that um, during complementary feeding, infants need repeated exposure to food. So things like bitter foods that they will tend to, they, d they don't have an innate liking for, you may need to expose them 15 times or more before they'll actually accept it, and parents often give up quite early. And if the, if the baby makes a face and seems to reject it, they need to be encouraged to persist in order to get them to accept those tastes. I think what we don't know is so much about the later effects, or that some of these sort of so-called early programming effects of taste, really the, the studies are only in the first few months. We don't actually know whether it alters your subsequent food preferences later on. So there's more work to be done there. With this 
concluding remark, I would like to thank you all for your, pres for your presence, for joining us in this session. The question today was where the nutrition, which where are the nutrition challenges ahead? The path was set by Professor Sanders as it appears that diabetes and obesity are the new public health challenges. Of course, without underscoring the accomplishments of clinical practice, we should underline prevention. And I'm sure that all the speakers will keep me right in this direction. And uh, apparently, epigenetics will be the talk of the town for the coming years and dynamics between gene and nutrient, and how diet can affect the gut bio microbiome. And in the end, the new challenges, of course, are how to introduce new products or to introduce new varieties of existing products in our diet so as to respect biodiversity. Once again, thank you all for your patience and for your contribution. And there are posters related to this session, so you are kindly invited to visit and have a look and discuss with the presenters. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.